Thanks very much for that, Nina, um, and introducing the event. Um, my name's Leah Ganley, and I'm the Information and Communications Officer for Fife Centre for Qualities, and um, I'll be chairing this event this evening. Um, I think a few of you were at our previous event that we had for the council elections just over a month ago, uh, which was again well attended by people in Fife um, coming to hear um, what the prospective councillors had to say um, on issues relating to quality. Um, and this evening um, we've got a slightly different focus because um, obviously it's a general election now, um, so again it's going to be equality related questions um, but more focused at um, what's happening in um, Westminster and the general election because obviously it's different powers there. Um, you'll also notice um, that we have um, a lot less candidates than we did last time if you were here. Um, we had 10 candidates last time, we had to have two sessions. Uh, because there was so much interest um, from different political parties and also from um, independent um, candidates. This time, for whatever reason, the um, political parties, there's only four um, parties standing. We did invite other ones, but um, they're not standing. So um, I'll just introduce the candidates. Um, and then once I've done that, I'll give the candidates um, five minutes to speak to introduce themselves. So, um, just to my left, we've got James Calder, who's from the Scottish Liberal Democrats. Um, then we've got uh, uh, Dave Dempsey from the Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party, Leslie Laird from the Scottish Labour Party, and Roger Mullen from the Scottish National Party. Um, so, I'd just like to welcome them all um, this evening um, and to come and face your questions. Um, just on a point for the candidates, when you're um, speaking there's a button here, if you can just press that down so it switches your mic on and then when you're finished just switch it off again um, just so that we don't get feedback and things. Um, so just a reminder that if everyone can fill out their survey um, and then we'll have um, Nyoka and Pat will go around collecting them and then we can get some um, feedback and we'll, once we've got those figures we can give you some information about what people's voting intentions are and also um, the um, matters that um, are affecting you and that um, you want to find out about in this election. Um, so I'll get on with the speeches now. Okay, so um, we're just going to go um, from this way, um, top to the table to the end. So that's an alphabetical order. So we've got um, James Calder first. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leah, and uh, I'd like to start off by thanking the uh, Fife Centre of Equalities for hosting this uh, hustings tonight, and, and obviously for yourself, Leah, to, uh, to chair it. Uh, my name is James Calder. I am the Scottish Liberal Democrat candidate for Dunfermline and West Fife, uh, and I'm also a councillor in Dunfermline South. Uh, I think, really, I, I'd like to start the, you know, the discussion here with the, sort of the big elephant in the room, as it were, um, which is Brexit and also to another extent as well Scottish independence. Uh, these seem to be uh, sort of two of the biggest questions that are taking place at the moment. And uh, I think both of them have a sort of significant impact on the subject of equalities as well. Uh, so in terms of Brexit, we seem to, and on independence, there seems to be very polarised viewpoints that are taking place here. And I mean, the, the, the Conservative Party under Theresa May obviously quite vigorously pursuing a, a hard Brexit agenda. It's uh, kind of aping a, a lot of Nigel Farage's policies, to be honest. But, um, and then we've got the SNP who are once again, uh, you know, very much uh, looking towards the, the whole independence question. And I'm not really sure what Labour's approach is to either because they seem to be coming out with different views on, on each of them. Um, the Liberal Democrats are very clear. We don't want to see independence in Scotland and we are very much opposed to this. We think that we work well with the rest of the United Kingdom. But we also want to work with the, the European Union. We, we don't want to see our, us cutting our ties and you know, for that matter, when it comes to Brexit negotiations, and we do accept the result of the referendum, but we feel that we should be aiming to try and get the best possible deal with Europe and that means getting single market access but also more importantly we, should, we shouldn't be trusting just a few politicians to make the decision that could be 
affecting our futures and our children's futures. Um, you know, the wrong deal could lead to economic consequences that would be very dire. And even some senior conservatives have started admitting that. I think Jeremy Hunt um, was one that did that recently. So we think that the people, and not just Theresa May, should actually have the final say on the Brexit deal. And if they like it, then that's fair enough. But if they don't, we should be, you know, reconsidering what our, our views here. I mean, the Liberal Democrats are pretty much the only party that are that are, you know, reflecting the views of people of Scotland and the people of Fife. In that we are opposed to independence, which the majority of people in Fife and in Scotland voted against independence in 2014. But we're also in favour of working with the European Union as the majority of people in Scotland voted for, and the majority of people in Fife voted for uh, last year. So, you know, we've got a very clear policy position on this, and uh, I think the, uh, you know, in terms of the other parties, it's either not clear or they're, you know, they're wanting to ignore a significant proportion of the people in Scotland and in Fife. Um, in terms of equalities, I think, uh, you know, for the Liberal Democrats, this is quite an important, uh, you know, important thing for us. I mean, there's uh, obviously equality is fairly, you know, wide-ranging word, and it, it can be used to describe, for example, um, you know, equalities between uh, gender in terms of sexual orientation, in terms of um, you know, the ethnic groups. Uh, it's it's very wide-ranging, and you know, for us, this is very important. I mean, we're as a party, we're very clear that we would like to see a greater effort by the, the government in promoting equalities. Um, so this means none of this kind of nonsense about uh, coming from the Conservative Party about having you know these kind of quotas on immigration. It's, it's quite negative in a way, and it's almost suggesting that immigrants are somehow a bad thing to society. I mean, I can tell you now. My wife's just there, and uh, she is uh, an expatriate from Belgium, and she's, she contributes positively to society. She pays her taxes, she works here, she's never taken a penny in benefits, despite what maybe the Daily Mail or the Sun might claim. Um, and this is really important to me, that we actually start addressing some of these views. But there's... Sorry? Oh, okay. Um, no, it's 30 seconds left. Oh, okay. uh, sorry. Uh, anyway, I'll, I'll just try and sum up because obviously I'm running out of time. But um, we, you know, we, we want to see you know qualities for other groups as well, and more work to help, for example, disabled people, and you know, obviously, uh, you know, you know, more work towards ending, you know, sort of racism and these kind of issues as well, and also. Uh, you know, I mean, like one of the, the policies that I think is really positive is in terms of uh, transgender um, issues. Is I mean, we've been putting uh, people that are okay as an ident you know I identify as one uh, gender into the prison uh, of the other gender. That's that's led to suicides, and I think that's a very positive thing. And I think we're you know we're on the right track here. And uh, yes, I'll just sort of end by saying thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thanks for inviting me. And thanks to you for being here this evening. I'm Dave Dempsey. Um, I was born in Kirkcaldy, brought up here, went to Dunnagear Primary, Kirkcaldy High, went far away, and I've came most of the way back, and have spent the last 30 years living in North Queensferry. Um, I spent most of my working life writing computer software. But then, through a strange process that still leaves me scratching my head now and again, I found myself um, a politician. I've been a councillor for 10 years, just been elected for the third time for Inverkeith and Dalgetty Bay, and I've led the Conservative group on the council for most of that time. Um, I'm not going to give you a big long spiel about policies and things, I'm just going to go up, do something that I think probably comes from being um, a mathematician, that was my degree, and engineer was my main trade, of breaking things down to the basics and looking for the deep underlying 
trends and factors. And I keep coming back in this campaign to two things. We've had two big votes in the last big referenda in the last few years. We had a vote on whether the people of Scotland wish to be part of the people of the UK, and they said, yes, they do. And then we had a vote whether the people of the UK wish to leave the EU, and the answer is, yes, they do. And my campaign has been built on trusting and believing in the people um, and taking forward what they have said they want. So we're going to stay in the UK, I hope, and we're going to leave the EU and it's going to be a success. And I'm going to stop there because the less time I speak now, the more time we have for your questions later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. Um, and now on to Leslie Laird from Scottish Labour. Well, good evening. My name is Leslie Laird and I'm the Scottish Labour candidate here in uh, this constituency. I really want to say thank you very much for the invitation to come along tonight and to have the opportunity to perhaps not to talk about independence and not to talk about referendum, but actually to talk about some of the really important issues that seem to have been somewhat neglected. And I think equalities issues for me is certainly one of those issues that really does need some careful focus and attention. I'm particularly delighted of the Labour Party's record on equalities. We are the party of social justice and equality. We are the party that brought the Equal Pay Right. We enshrined the Human Rights Act as we know it today in law in 1998. We are the party that introduced paternity pay and maternity pay. And it's those things that, over the course of the last 10 years, have unfortunately been eroded and been neglected. And if the impact of any of these events is coming in terms of where we look at our post-Brexit country, then there is a real danger that many of these equalities and issues that have been fought for by our fathers and our grandfathers over many years are going to disappear. And for me, that's the important thing that we need to be thinking about. We need to be thinking about all the things that have been fought for and won and to make sure that we, in the midst of all of this, we don't get polarised and stop to think about the things that really matter day in and day out to all of us. And that's why I'm delighted that the Labour Party's manifesto is bringing us back to some of those fundamentals <coughs> and basics, thinking about the things that really matter to people day in and day out. And equalities issues are absolutely one of those issues. We need to think about what will happen um, going forward. But we also need to reflect about where we are even today under the current Conservative government and how they have eroded some of the basic rights that have been fought for. And none more so than rights for women. Women have borne the brunt of welfare reform changes and women have started to see rights around things like maternity leave being eroded. And clearly um, we need to stand up, as we have done in the past, and fight for those things. Our manifesto is about the many and not the few. And in our manifesto we address a number of equality rights that I think are essential and important that as a society, if we want to continue to grow and evolve as a society, we need to address. So we need to look at aspects around gender equality and I'm pleased that that's one of the areas that the Labour Party has uh, identified within its um, manifesto is addressing. It's also about protecting the rights of dis disabled people and again enshrining that law just as we did with uh, the Human Rights Convention. These are the things that fundamentally shape the kind of society that we want to live in. And as we go through this debate, I want to be able to share and talk with you about some of the issues that I think are really about the many and not the few, and really about the kind of society we want to live in. Because equality is really about shaping that place, and all of us have a part to play in that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And finally, Roger Mullen from the Scottish National Party. Thank you very much, and thanks for the invitation. I'm so glad there's at least one Hustings. I'm old enough to remember when there used to be one a day, and in some ways I would prefer that when people had a greater opportunity to engage with candidates. Uh, let me just explain my background and why I'm interested in equalities first, and secondly, what I've been engaged in on these matters in Parliament over the last two years. I think there are three things that have influenced me in particular. In my working life before I became an MP, I undertook 27 international assignments, almost entirely in the developing world, working in some of the poorest countries in the world, also working in countries suffering the aftermath of conflict. 
Nobody could have that, that kind of experience and not but be touched by the inequalities in this world of ours. Secondly, the, I used to run little research companies and some of the research I did, for example, I did a major study of suicide in Northern Ireland, did a study of women in the labour force in Namibia, in Africa, and so that I've got a, an interest, if you like, a professional interest in what inspires people to be concerned about equality, but also some of the ways in which equality's issues permeate so much of our life that very often we're unaware of. And I think the third thing that creates an interest for me is uh, very personal. Uh, the proudest statement I heard from a Mullen over the last two years was not from myself. It was from my wife Barbara, who decided a few months ago that she would give an interview to a national newspaper about the effect on her of being sexually abused at the age of only six years old. It has taken her literally a lifetime to feel that she can begin to speak about those issues. And I think if there's anything that can be done to help people talk about things that affect them and the way in which they are placed in disadvantageous positions in society, that's something I think that's affected me greatly. In Parliament, there's a number of things I've been doing related to equalities. One of the first was, I, I can't say I'm proud about having to do this, but I was the first MP in Westminster that raised the issue of the EU nationals, right not just to stay here, but to have rights here as well. I raised that before the uh, European uh, referendum vote took place because I was deeply concerned about the rhetoric surrounding immigration and the like that surrounded that uh, uh, vote. Secondly, I was very pleased to support my colleague, Dr. Ailey Whiteford, when she brought forward a private member's bill that was ultimately successful in past to require the UK government to not just to have signed the Istanbul Convention, but to commit to implementing the Istanbul Convention, which is concerned about domestic abuse and uh, uh, female abuse in society. Thirdly, although it was a great disappointment to me because not enough MPs turned up to get it through, I was very keen to support my colleague John Nicholson when he brought forward the Turing Bill, which was basically to address the, what I think is the iniquity of LGBTI individuals who suffered uh, and were criminalised in the past to give them a complete pardon for what had happened in the past. And finally, when I was given the opportunity to bring forward a private member's bill, although it again wasn't successful, I brought one forward related to international tax treaties. Many people are concerned, and rightly, about the way in which there seems to be a body of opinion saying that the UK should not contribute the 0.7% to the developing world. I'm also concerned, however, with the fact that if you take Africa as a whole, the African continent loses more money through unfair tax treaties than it gains in all of foreign aid. And I was pleased to be able to bring forward a bill, and if I was fortunate enough to be re-elected, I would want to pursue that as well. Thanks very much. Now, um, we're going to get into the questions. Um, I'll just um, highlight that um, we, as Nina said, we have the social media, um, so if anyone wants to contribute um, to the discussion tonight, um, if you've got any thoughts on what people are saying, then you can do hashtag FCE hustings. It's along the front and also hashtag um, GE2017. Um, now just to begin, um, I, we've got a question that we would like to ask. Um, obviously being an equalities organisation, um, equality and diversity and inclusion is um, very important to us. And um, so we're going to get the first question from one of our volunteers, Mary. Um, over to you. We've got a mic there. Hi, my name's Mary. Um, I've got a question about diversity within politics. At the general election in 2015, 29 
53% of MPs are female, 53% are over 50 year old, 6% are not of a non-white background. Um, the share of manual workers has fallen from 16% in 1979 to 3% in 2015. What will you do to change the face of politics and make it more inclusive? Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll just take another um, question as well, does anyone, and then we'll come back to the panel. Yourself? As, as we spoke about um, <coughs> things like maternity pay and equal pay and so forth, and you pointed out that the Labour Party is very proud that you brought these things forward, which is good. But I was confused when you then said that we should remain in Europe in order to safeguard these advances. Surely it's a trade union movement which has brought us these improvements in the trade union movement which would retain them for us. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll just um, come back to the panel um, on those questions about how do we um, make politics more inclusive with more representation from um, women in particular, people from um, non-white backgrounds and also um, looking at it from a, um, a class perspective as well um, and also the, the question um, asked there. So if anyone else wants to come back, I know it's um, addressed directly to Leslie, but if anyone wants to come back on it, they can. So just indicate. Do you want to come? Okay, do you want me to take that one first? Yeah, if you want me. Okay. I, I'm not sure. I, you perhaps picked me up, but I thought I'm basically saying is that uh, yes, we did fight for those rights. As a daughter of a trade unionist, I absolutely know about fighting for workers' rights. Leslie, and so can you just um, bring us a bit closer? To is that better now? Is that better? Okay. It's over radio, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. So, as a daughter of a trade unionist, I, I absolutely advocate the role of the trade union movement. I, and all of the rights that were fought were fought really by people like my dad and my grandfather, who for long periods of time I, didn't work because he was basically blacklisted and not allowed to work because of his views. So, I, what I'm saying is that through the course, though, of our membership of the European Union, we have and gained uh, a lot of benefits, both in things like health and safety and other rights, all of which we need to make sure that are not lost when we leave the EU. We need to make sure that they are enshrined in law and stay in law. And if you look at some of the, um, I suppose, the, the undercurrent of the Conservative Manifesto, it's very clear that there would be an attack on some of those rights. We haven't yet left the EU and we can already see attack on a number of rights for women. Uh, I mentioned the number of uh, dismissals, for example, uh, for, for uh, women who are pregnant. That's increased to something like 54,000 um, and no support for those. If you look at tribunal fees as well, that's a real issue because people then can't actually take their case even when they have one. They can't afford to take their case and actually go and make their case. So what I'm really saying is that if we are leaving the EU, we need to make sure we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. We keep those rights that we have and we bring the trade union movement and the businesses together to make sure that we preserve what we've got and we continue to improve and develop that as society needs it. Um, did you want to answer the other question as well? Just, yeah, thanks. That, that really uh, strikes a chord for me in my previous show, which I didn't uh, touch on. My role was in uh, human resources. So all my life I've worked on equality based on employment law or policy. In my very last role, um, it was about uh, talent management and succession management. So looking at the pipeline, and if you want to look at diversity, then I guess my question is just look, you know, my statement would be look at the panel that we have here tonight. So going forward, I think we do need to take a bit of a different approach to things. Um, if I consider as a woman that we've had the Equal Pay Act for 40 years, yet we still don't have equal pay or equal rights for women in the workplace, it tells you that legislation is not enough and not enough by itself to necessarily do that. So I welcome Labour's manifesto commitment to actually try and push that to the next level by actually looking at that in terms of how we actually get more uh, gendered equality by looking at companies and what they pay, particularly the larger companies. And having worked for some of those larger companies, I can certainly um, reflect that that would be a good thing to do. I also reflect uh, other aspects where we're not seeing enough women's representation, but actually not enough diversity more generally in our society. 
Um, one of the areas that I looked at previously was women on boards in Norway. Uh, it really kind of set the scene for that uh, in terms of legislating for that, where the Norwegian government simply laid down a challenge to business in the PLC and private se in the public sector to say, you've got two years basically to increase the representation of women on your boards and we set a target of 30%. And that was required to be done. So I think there does come a point where you have to see if society and industry and business is not prepared to make the club more inclusive, then we have to find other ways to try to do that. And I think we have to look carefully at legislation, but we're left to itself. Equal pay has not delivered equal pay, so I rest my case on that point. Thank you. Roger? Okay. Thanks very much. Better put it on. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, let me deal with uh, uh, both the questions that were raised. First of all, inclusive politics. If we can pick up the last point that Leslie made, which I'm very sympathetic towards, the thing that I was most sympathetic towards was one of the very last publications of a select committee at Westminster uh, was a recommendation that of PLC companies in the UK, the aim should be to have 50% women. And that was agreed by all the party representatives that were on that committee. Now, that's merely a report from a select committee, but I think in a new parliament, I hope the new group of MPs will take issues like that forward and try to press for much greater equality and representation in, in boards. I'm very, I've always been very concerned about uh, uh, women and minorities engaging in politics, right back from when I was a student, which is a few years ago, and I did a dissertation on women in politics. One of the problems that I've seen over the last two years, and this is where I've got great sympathy with the person who asked the question, I am that over 50 white middle class male that you talked about that's in Parliament. Right. And in many ways, I have to admit, it's relatively easy for somebody like myself and it would be relatively easy for uh, some of the other panellists in terms of what they would face in public scrutiny, in the press, day in, day out. All I can say is that the, uh, I've learned a lot by watching the quite malicious attacks that have been made on people like Mary Black because she's young and female and Tasmina Ahmed Sheikh because she's a black Muslim female. Right? Uh, the number of times that the police have had to be called in, I know, because of the threats that have been made against Tasmina have been quite and utterly deplorable. It's going to be very difficult to encourage people who are currently underrepresented in our politics if we put up with the kind of rhetoric that uh, affects much of our political dialogue today. So I think that it's not merely a legislative matter, it's a matter for everybody to make sure that we conduct ourselves in a manner that is not exclusive and does not serve one small group that I'm part of to the exclusion of others. I've got great sympathy with what Bill said about the trade union uh, uh, role in terms of uh, equality pay and a whole host of other issues, of course, related to equality. And that's why, you know, I was perfectly happy uh, to oppose the trade union bill that was pushed through in the last parliament by the Tory government. And whatever happens, I hope that it's possible somehow to get that either completely written off the statute book or in some way ameliorated. Because I believe that the problem is the weight of much of the debate that's going on in society at the moment is changing the balance to the disadvantages of those who want to campaign for what I would broadly say are their legitimate social, economic and justice rights in our society. Of course, it's legitimate to say that there is an issue related to the EU. We have got a great repeal bill going to be brought forward where initially the claim was by the UK government that all the existing rights, laws, standards and regulations 
that exist because of the EU over the last few years would initially be fully incorporated incorporated within this great repeal bill, 134,500 of them. So it's going to be a pretty big bill. So I subsequently wrote to David Davis and said, could you guarantee that every right that we have because of our membership of the EU, such as our European citizens' rights, are almost entirely there because of EU legislation, not because of UK legislation. And his reply indicated that I can happily show the letter to anybody that doubts me, said we're not going to be able to incorporate everything into the Great Repeal Bill, but we are not clear as yet what we're not going to be able to incorporate. So, I, although I uh, understand what you're saying, Bill, in terms of trade union, I do think there is a dimension to this that has to be addressed in relation to how Brexit is going to be taken forward. Thank you. <coughs> um, James? Okay, um, I'd like to answer both questions as well. Uh, in terms of the uh, di increasing diversity in politics, I think this is uh, you know, very important. I mean, as I say, looking at the, uh, the makeup of uh, us here, we're not particularly diverse, apart from maybe maybe Leslie being a woman, but um, there is a uh, there is a real need to actually do better, and I think this this actually comes for this situation for uh, all political parties. Uh, I'm very happy that the, uh, the Liberal Democrats have taken on a policy of uh, all female shortlists and, and target seats in order to try and increase the number of female MPs in the party, uh, and I think this will uh, this will, will certainly come to help address things. Um, we also have a uh, diversity working group in Scottish Liberal Democrats, which my, my wife is a member of, and uh, uh, the, the whole point of this is to try and increase sort of political participation, you know, within the Liberal Democrats, in uh, in uh, you know, for people from various different underrepresented groups, uh, be it you know, from underrepresented ethnic minorities or um, say uh, women and. Uh, disabled people. This is it's really you know we we've got to tackle this head on, and it, you know it's a really important point. And you know until until we do, the there are going to be groups in society that will be generally disadvantaged in society. And uh, I think that you know this is this work it's a work in progress, and there's a lot more to do. And uh, there's this I think uh, you know at least for my party. Is we definitely do not want to be taking the, the foot off the pedal there. Um, in terms of your um, sort of the workers' rights that you've discussed, I mean, I'm I'm very concerned about what's going to happen here after after we leave the EU. If the Conservatives are re-elected, the there have been suggestions by some in the Conservative Party that we could have a Singapore-style economy where effectively workers' rights would be jettisoned. Now, I've worked in Singapore before in my, in my role in an IT business, and I've seen exactly what the workers' rights there are, and it is, it is absolutely terrible, and it's, and it's quite scary. Now, the European Union does safeguard a lot of workers' rights, and quite frankly, there's a reason why a lot of people on the right of the political spectrum wanted to leave the EU, because they wanted rid of the, you know, these annoying workers' rights that uh, are guaranteed by the European Union. Of course, you know, trade unions have played an, you know, a part in, in developing these rights over the years, but you know, we've had the safeguard in the European Union. So uh, I think the, the, the point is that whatever the outcome of the whole Brexit process is, we need to be guaranteeing that all rights, whether, for example, it's things like maternity pay, um, you know, these kind of things, they they need to be maintained, and we you know we we need to have safeguards to ensure that uh, no conservative government can go and effectively jettison them all in order to create this kind of uh, this right wing utopia that they've been uh, they've been looking at doing. Thank you, and uh, Dave. Thank you. <coughs> I, I find it slightly disappointing, this, this idea that we have to stay in the EU in order to protect ourselves against ourselves. Um, I find this, this notion that there's some kind of 
collection of ravenous conservative beasts on there who want to rip up everything and, and take us back to the dark ages. So it was fantastical. I mean, I am the face of the Conservative Party in Fife as much as it has one. I don't want any of that. I voted to leave. I didn't vote to leave in order to rip up anybody's rights, at least, at least of all my own. I voted to leave because I wanted to, the country to be free of the, the bureaucracy. I voted to leave because um, I looked at it and thought, if we vote to stay in, the, the Eurocrats will see that as a green light to go towards an ever more integrated and ever less responsive EU. That was my particular take on it. All the people, millions of people who voted will have taken their own particular lines on it. I did not do it to rip up anybody's rights. The, the diversity thing. Um, I'm quite male in what, I, in what I like to think early middle age. And, thank you. And uh, I can't do anything about that. And I like to think that I've got to where I have in, in politics and in life for that matter on a combination of, of hard work, knuckling down and a degree of um, talent and ability. And I would be unhappy at any idea that says that I would be excluded from something, not because of anything about me, but because too many other people were like me. I think that would be horribly fundamentally wrong. Now, we're on a bit of an up at the moment, but the, being in the, the, the Conservatives in South West Fife, um, as I have been for 17 years, um, I wasn't born to this at all. Um, the, it's quite a lonely task, and quite a lonely, a, a lonely furrow to plough for a, a long time. And we don't turn people away because of any characteristics. We don't turn anybody away. We cannot afford to turn anybody away. There's not enough of us as it is. Everybody who wanted to be a council candidate a few weeks ago was a council candidate, without exception. In Southwest, I'm talking Southwest Fife at the moment, yeah. Um, th th that's a long story about that, which would be fair to be in public. We did not turn anybody away on any kind of diversity or any characteristic of any sort. You, you, those of you who were here a few weeks ago would have um, seen David Ross, um, the other one, not the one who's parked somewhere over there at the moment, um, who's now Councillor David Ross or David J. Ross, as we're going to have to call him, to distinguish him from the, the old version. Um, the, there's an example of somebody who, who belongs to a minority, he's got no sight. Um, we've encouraged him, we've brought him on. He's, he's done it primarily by himself, he's a fantastic mm. individual, but we've got no objection but the, the, to, to anybody on any grounds. We turn nobody away. And that's how it should be. Treat everybody on their individual merits. Don't go looking for quotas. Don't go looking saying you've got too many males, you've got too many folk of a particular age group, you've got too many of a particular colour. Just encourage everybody and the cream will come to the top. Sorry, just a, a, a quick interruption just to give uh, uh, the audience uh, a little flavour of uh, what are the key issues that um, the audience feel uh, are important for this particular issue. I mean, Brexit come top, uh, public spending cuts actually equally important as Brexit, and then uh, following that, uh, welfare reform. Um, and in terms of what factors influence uh, who you will vote for, what's top is achievements of the party. And then, then the next one is transparency of the party leader. We also, sorry. we also asked the audience um, who they are likely to vote for uh, this coming election. A uh, majority of people didn't respond. Uh, those who responded, uh, come top, will be uh, SNP, and then uh, Labour uh, comes second. And, and then Conservatives and uh, Liberal Democrats uh, join, join third. So we'll, we'll come back at the end to see whether there's any changes at the end. So, the lady at the front there. Hi. Um, Patricia Clay for 
Yeah, no. I've been on stage for a um, Patricia Claycorn, I have a company called Orchid, the byline is to help you flourish. We work with businesses, also with young people, lecturers in colleges predominantly, universities and schools. Um, so I'm first to say really pleased that this is being held tonight. I've ventured, well not ventured, I sort of went around on Twitter trying to find out and eventually came up with the goods. I knew it was going to be a good meeting because it got so comfortable last time. And I have been to some of these meetings. I've not felt comfortable, particularly in Edinburgh. Um, Business for Scotland, I think it's called. The most fun that's been experience, I have to say. Um, now, um, interested, I've got three questions, but just interested in the thing on equality for women, women on boards, what is happening there. Did someone say 50%? Surely that's not been reached as yet. Uh, uh, <laughs> no. Sorry, if I could say, yeah. it was a select committee uh -huh. in the House of Commons. Yeah, the business committee made that recommendation yeah. just before dissolution yeah. to work towards. Yeah. Because Lord, uh, the Lord Davis Commission hasn't even been met yet. Yeah, there's uh, been it's, it's very you know, old representation. And, uh, you know, the, the head of the Law Society in Scotland, and, you know, I, I do think the Old Boys Network is alive and kicking in Scotland, Central Scotland certainly, said if the men on the board, if it was on merit, they wouldn't even see the pictures in the boardroom. And I think that that is something that does need to be really looked at. Now my question is then, um, what is one thing that your party has done in the last two years that has helped the people in Scotland with regard to equality? Secondly, um, I think there's a great inequality of pensions. How is this going to work out? Um, particularly with regard to the independence thing, I can't see how all the people in the UK can equal the limited number of people in Scotland. Whatever the ratio is, it's still going to get the, 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 the same pension. So, so just, I've got one more. Well, may I just ask that you just do two questions? Okay, so, what, that's fine. so what was that second question? Sorry. The second question. About pension, is, what is that yes, question? Yeah, that, well, how is that going to work out with regard to having some sort of equality in, in okay, pensions, course, really? Because particularly, you know, the whole of the UK via Scotland, because there's so many more people in the UK to contribute to. A okay. large, what is a large pension scheme? So okay. I'm pleased to be. Thank you. I'll just take some more questions from uh, other people in the audience, and then we'll come back. Uh, Stuart. Stuart. Hi, Sam. Oops. There we go. Um, I think, in fairness uh, to everybody else, I want to ask a question. I'll keep it to one, actually. Um, I wonder if the parties would like to comment on uh, how the UK can be a safe haven for people abroad who are persecuted because of their views and their sexuality and their gender identity. Thank you. Okay, and I'll just take one more. This is just in response to something that Leslie said. Uh, I just feel that sometimes before every general election, there's always a woman card keeps coming up, and I'm a woman, <laughs> you know, but I'm not saying an injustice by saying this, but I just feel that before every election, this keeps coming up, whereas I do understand all the inequality towards women, but don't ever let us forget that there's young boys and there's men of all ages, zero hours minimum wage, you know, so you have to think about everybody regarding, you know, Equal rights towards men and women. Thank you. Um, Shall we take this question as well? Okay. Yep. Hello there, Sean Robertson. Um, my question is about welfare reform. Um, and there are an estimated 13 million people in the UK with a disability, and many rely on benefits to survive. Um, the United Nations found last year that cuts to these benefits have resulted in a grave and systematic violation of the human rights of people's, people with disabilities. What do you think can be done to tackle this? Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so I think that's a few questions. I'll just quickly run through them. So there's a question about um, welfare reform 
and um, disabilities. There's a question um, about one thing that your party has done. Um, there's pensions and safe haven um, for people abroad. And if anyone wants to comment on the issue about uh, it's not just an issue about women um, and quality, it's uh, broader. So there's a lot of stuff for people to come back. So if anyone wants to indicate who wants to come first. <laughs> Be quick in answering them all. Uh, uh, first of all, in terms of welfare and reform, of the 1,400 individual cases I've dealt with in the last few years, the largest single category. Sorry, the largest single category of people coming to us with problems. It's been associated with the welfare reforms and the cutbacks that people in this constituency have faced. Sorry. Oh, that's right. The point that was made about disability is particularly important. The, what has happened in the uh, comparatively recent time, there's been attack, for example, on those with disabilities who would have mobility cars, there's been lots of people have been losing them and I've had a number of cases coming about that. There's been the whole issue of assessment of people, whether they're entitled to credits or different forms of welfare that has been undertaken in, I think, a completely inappropriate way. So what we need to do is move away from that and try to oppose the way in which welfare is being managed in this country. If I, I'm going to try and be brief in them all. If I go to the gentleman at the back who I think was asking about uh, uh, providing a safe haven or a safe place for people, uh, I'm kind of ashamed that the United Kingdom has been taking so few refugees as they have and particularly ashamed that the very modest number of children that were going to be taken in through the so-called Dubs Amendment has been uh, thrown out by this government. About eight weeks ago I was in Iraqi Kurdistan and Kurd the Iraqi Kurdistan has got a, a population not dissimilar to Scotland. It has taken in 1.8 million displaced persons from the conflict in Mosul, a city that's not all that far away and also from refugees in other parts of the Middle East. When I talked with the leaders of the three main political parties in Iraqi Kurdistan, who don't get on all that well together, you would find it difficult to put them on a platform like this. But the one thing that struck me is when they were all saying, effectively they felt it was their responsibility to provide a safe haven. When we are saying we are putting a cap on of 20,000 and not even reaching that, when to some extent, I'm not saying wholly, but to some extent we have been contributors to a lot of the turmoil in this world and to some of those conflicts. I think we need to be far more generous and do far more and be far more welcoming than we have been. In terms of the issue about uh, 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 equalities and pensions, one of the things that I'm very, I, I think is bad, but that actually, you know, from a very sad point of view, reduces the burden of pensions to Scotland compared with the rest of the UK, is that we actually have a lower life expectancy. Now that is not a good thing, but it does raise fundamental questions about the way in which the UK government have decided that a main way of them reforming the pensions is to increase the age at which people become entitled to it. You know, there are some areas in Scotland, areas where the average life expectancy is hovering around 60. So when you have a situation where people are facing retirement ages of 68, and we know that the government have not published their response, which they were supposed to publish on the 8th of May, about the latest recommendations about where the pension age is going to go in the future. They've said they're delaying that until after the general election. I'm not hopeful. I fear that what they're going to do is increase it still further. And there have been equality issues within the issues of pensions, not least what is known as the Bosby women, women who were born in the early 1950s, who've not only had their pension age raised dramatically, 
but they've done so without being given due notice from the government. There's been two different pension reports over the last uh, five to ten years that said if you're going to increase pensions, one of them said there should be a minimum notice period of ten years, and one of them said there should be a minimum notice period of 15 years, otherwise how can people play, uh, plan? Some of these WASPI women have been given a notice of less than two years for significant increases in retirement age. So I think that's a, an equality aspect that concerns me. I'll start with this lady's question, but it said, don't just play the woman's card. And I guess um, what the Labour Manifesto is saying is, it's absolutely not about playing, playing any card. It's about understanding the many and not the few. On a lighter note, I saw a little thing on Facebook this morning, which kind of started my day, which says, under the Conservative Fertives, don't be young, don't be old, and don't be sick, and don't be a fox. So um, that probably kind of summed it up for me in terms of um, the qualities issue. But to address the points that you've made, um, I think it's really important that we look at some of the injustices that actually have happened. But women have borne uh, a lot of those injustices uh, through that last period. However, um, the Labour Party also recognises the inequality of work. Uh, we seem to have lost uh, fair day's work for fair day's pay and that's why the £10 minimum wage is absolutely fundamental about addressing equality. We talk about poverty issues in our society. And if you look at the growth of poverty under the Conservatives, and sadly, I have to say, for Roger, under the SNP here in Scotland, then we're in a situation that you must address the poverty issue. You must really tackle what is at the root cause of that. And in my previous life, I worked in, in businesses where I worked with engineers, and engineers always said to me, what is the root cause of the problem? The root cause of the problem is we don't have an economy that's working, we don't have enough people in work, we don't have enough people in well-paid work. And sadly, what we're also seeing is too many people who are even in work not being able to make ends meet. And these are the fundamental issues that if we're talking about an equal society, if you haven't got the foundations of your economy right, if you don't look after the basics, the basics of having a safe place to live, a warm, dry home, an income where you can feed your family and you don't just have to keep worrying about where your next bill is coming from. You can put your fire on when it's cold. All of these things are under attack. They're all under attack. And that's why the Labour Manifesto for me addresses those issues. We are not going to uh, ignore the pension triple lock guarantee. We've said in our manifesto, if we're elected, we will make sure that that is safeguarded. We've also said we will address the two and a half uh, million WASPy women who have had their pension rights basically discarded by this Conservative government. We have also addressed the inequality around welfare reform and if you look at some of the impacts of that and the growing number of people who are in poverty then you have to understand the root cause and the links that there is to that. So we, would, we will scrap the assessments, particularly assessments for people who have long-term ongoing illnesses who have been subject to all sorts of tests by private companies that is just not fundamentally right and no dignity in the way around which these have been conducted. Um, it's also about recognising what we need to do for young people. So addressing the old, yeah, we've got the triple lock, we've got our bus passes and the fuel. And again, it comes back to my starting point. These are all benefits and entitlements that have been hard fought and hard won. And why should we now use those as bargaining chips because the Conservative Party made a bad call, they couldn't keep their right wing in check, David Cameron couldn't do it, Theresa May can't do it, and hence this is where we are now. The reason we've got the general election is because Theresa May is trying to say we need a, we need a mandate to go and negotiate a better deal for Brexit. No, you just need to take care of the day job. That's what you're elected to do, and that's mm -hmm. sadly what governments, both north and south of the border, have absolutely not been doing. And that's why we need to get back to addressing some of those issues. I think it's also really important about understanding about where, where do we go with pensions. Well, if we, if we want to make sure that we have pensions, we can plan for pensions, the bigger the pool of people that you have contributing to the pension pot allows you to continue to have a pension scheme. And that comes back to you need a bigger pool of people, you need an economy that's working, <coughs> you need people earning money that can contribute. Those are the fundamentals of why we have a pension scheme in the first place. And if those are the things that we want to preserve, then please don't throw the baby out of the bathwater and please be clear about we voting for the many and not the audience many. to show some respect. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Well, I'll just reiterate those points because some people may have lost that in the, in the melee there. But what I'm really saying is, if you really want to be uh, having the kind of society that we have enjoyed, that, that our fathers and our mothers have enjoyed, and we want that going forward, then you need to make sure that you do actually have the fundamental building blocks in place. And that includes, that means getting people into work, work that pays a decent living, that we preserve pensions, that we look after our old, that we look after our young, that we're inclusive. The gentleman at the back also touched on what do we do about uh, refugees and I, I, I agree with Roger's comments. I think our treatment of refugees, our treatment and tolerance actually generally has, has deteriorated and I think part of our whole shift for us as a society is understanding what kind of society we want to be and what kind of people we want to be. And we have to be inclusive. I think that's the kind of place that I, I think our, uh, you know, our, our values would say that we would want to have. And I certainly hope that when we are voting and considering who we want to govern us for the next five years, that you will consider the values of the parties that you're looking at and consider and make your choices very, very carefully. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leslie. Um, now on to Dave. Thank you. Difficult to know how to navigate your way through such an interesting mix of questions. Um, one thought which did occur to me earlier on was that uh, which is the party that's given you women prime ministers? Think about that one. Um, the UK is a safe haven. The UK, Britain has been taking refugees and people um, fleeing from persecution for centuries. And it's right that we should do that, and it's right that we should continue to do that. But it's clearly difficult to distinguish between those who are genuinely fleeing from something and those who just fancy coming here. And we are not a big enough island to take everybody who might conceivably want to come here. So there needs to be um, some kind of line in the middle of that. The pensions, we've got a problem. I'm, I'm a pensioner. I'm actually old enough to, to qualify. Um, that nice man, the Chancellor, gives me money every month. And I, I don't feel old. I don't feel I'm at the end of the road. In fact, I feel I'm just warming up. And there's clearly been a huge shift, and it's, 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 it's a good thing. Okay, there are people who, who, whose life expectancy is very low, but life expectancy for most people is, is vastly bigger than it was even when I was a kid. And apparently, when the state pension was introduced, okay, it's a while ago, uh, the average person got it for four years. Now, you can pay for four years pension off 40 years of work. You can't pay for 40 years of pension off 40 years of work and make it make sense. So there's a huge issue there, and it's, it's a bigger one than I know the answer to. Um, human rights of the disabled. Well, a lot of these things are, are, are down to, to detail. Um, we, we, you get a considerable amount of agreement between the four of us about what, where things ought to go. Where we differ for the most part is the detail of how you get there. Um, one thing I've found discovered as a counsellor, um, having become a counsellor, is that until you're on the inside, you don't really understand what the problems are and how to go about fixing them. And I'm, I will be open with you um, tonight. I don't know the answers to most of these things. I need to be on the inside and find out what, what, how it works and then work out what the right answers are. Neither will I sit here tonight and tell you that every line and dot and comma in the Conservative Party manifesto is spot on how it ought to be, because I don't believe that. I just believe that on balance, it offers a better combination than any of the others. Okay, then. As, uh Interesting mix of questions there. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll start off by addressing the uh, gentleman who was discussing uh, refugees. Uh, I got to say that I think uh, I think it's uh, a little bit disingenuous to suggest that uh, we don't have space for refugees, as uh, David has suggested there. Uh, considering that uh, there's countries that have taken far more, I mean, we're talking about hundreds of thousands to well over a million refugees. Uh, and the fact that we've taken a few thousand, I think, I'm, I'm ashamed of that as a country. I, I, we really need to be doing more. There's a, there's a crisis going on at the moment. There's obviously, you know, 
places like you know Syria or Libya, it is a terrible situation. And the fact that we're only taking a few thousand, that we're you know there's at times slightly racist undercurrents in terms of the commentary about children who are refugees and you know people trying to claim all oh, their adults. Um, you know, just because they're, you know, maybe older teenagers, they're still children. And there's, I mean, we, we we're taking, I think, below the bare minimum of what we should be taking as a country, and we should be doing a lot more. And it's the responsibility of the British government to ensure that we do more. I've been proud that the Liberal Democrats as a party have been calling for us to actually take more refugees. And uh, that, that is one thing that I think is really important. So I'm glad you glad you phrased that question. Um, I'll uh, so carry on to Patricia, uh, who was um, uh, sort of discussing um, a few things like uh, the, what we've done uh, as a party for boosting economy, and, uh, equality, not economy, <laughs> uh, equality in the last couple of years. I mean, obviously the Liberal Democrats, we've not necessarily had the most, uh, the highest number of MPs or MSPs recently. We're, we're a little bit down in our luck, but. Uh, you know, we, we have been fighting for the issues of equality. Uh, I think one thing that I've been quite proud of that we've been doing the last few months is uh, fighting for the, the rights of EU citizens in Britain. Now, I'm absolutely appalled that the British government has not guaranteed the rights for three million people who have come here, who pay more taxes than they receive in uh, public spending. So this, that's different from the Brit you know, the average British person, where the average British person takes more in public spending than they pay in taxes at the moment. That's why we have a deficit. So why, from an economic point of view, not just that, from a human point of view, these are people that have made their lives here, who have settled down, who have you know, married people here, who have children here, they have their roots here. So why is the British government not just doing the simple thing and guaranteeing their rights? And I'm proud that the Liberal Democrats in the House of Lords, um, you know, fought the fight for EU citizens. Um, we we said for the uh, the Brexit bill, you know, that this isn't right. We need to guarantee the rights. Unfortunately, when it went back to the House of Commons, the Tories decided that they, they didn't care and that they uh, just wanted to ignore ignore that that aspect there and ignore the human uh, you know the human cost there that they're having. The stress this is causing, and I know this from first hand having a Belgian wife, the stress that what the Tories are doing is causing EU citizens in Britain, to me, that is appalling. Uh, but I'm proud that the Liberal Democrats have been fighting that fight. Uh, in terms of the inequalities in pensions, uh, I think there's, there's obviously it's a very complex question and it is a very complex answer. We're, you know, we, we, we as a society, we we are living longer, as, as David suggested, and uh, there needs to be ways of dealing with this. I, uh, I think the certainly in terms of you know the the answers, it is going to take a lot of thinking. But it's not maybe not necessarily been done in the best way by successive governments, and uh, it's 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 probably a situation where I think um, there probably needs to be actually. This is maybe the brightest and best from all you know sides of the spectrum to actually come together and discuss how the best way forward and ensuring that there are is better equality in pensions. Um, uh, let's see, you've got the uh, you mentioned the uh, minimum wage uh, for young people and uh, how there's obviously a lot of people and you know young people and not just young people but people of all age groups and it's not just obviously women, um, but you know obviously young guys as well. I mean, I understand there is, you know, we, we need to do more as a society to actually, you know, look at the, the jobs that have been created. And one of the problems we've had is although unemployment has gone down, the jobs that have sort of come in place have not been as high paying or as high skilled jobs as there were before. And it means that people are, you know, effectively now doing jobs where um, a few years ago they might have been paid a lot more. And it is, Long term, it's not particularly sustainable for us as a society. As a society, and there's possibly a situation where, in terms of our economy as a society, it's we've lost the um, lost a lot of the jobs which are high skilled jobs where people can 
um, you know, would earn more money but would also be more productive in what they're doing. And uh, it's going to require a, a serious amount of work by whoever's in government to actually try and promote better, you know, a society where there are better jobs, that are better paid, and will ultimately bring a, a better standard of life for people in the country. Um, and in terms of the sort of welfare and on the, um, the impact this has had on disabilities, it's, uh, it has, there's obviously been a lot of stories which um, in terms of you know, people that have been on uh, you know, benefits due to their disability or due to illness that they've, they've uh, suffered because of, you know, you know the, the, sort of the reforms that have taken place. It's, I think we've got to review you know, the, you know, the process there and review um, how, how the, you know, this is done because it's obviously to an extent not working and it's, you know, the, the current process for, you know, seeing, you know, assessing claims, you know, there's, there's been so many situations where it isn't working and we, and once again, I think this is something that whoever's in government, this is something that we have, um, that we need to tackle as a society to ensure that uh, whoever is, um, you know, whoever is on the welfare benefits, um, you know, because of their, you know, disability or because of illness, we, we can't be, you know, throwing people out when they quite clearly are not able to work. And it is a, it is a case of reviewing the, the current procedures and looking at uh, improving them. Thank you very much. Um, questions. So, take the lady there and then um, the gentleman there. Thank you, thank you very much. Kay Morrison, uh, my question was triggered by something that Roger said earlier in answer to another question. When you said, Roger, something like, I'm not quoting you absolutely accurately, that the perception is that you are someone who's in a relatively small group. This was in answer to an equalities, an earlier equalities question. And I would suggest that many voters see it that way too. I'm not talking just about you, Roger. Um, they believe that they believe that decisions are taken by the few, a very small number of people, and that control over their lives, over the lives of the many, in other words, is exercised by very few people. And sometimes those voters will say, very, very often these are voters who are from already disadvantaged backgrounds in disadvantaged situations. They will say they're not going to vote. They have no intention of voting. Why should I bother? They will add, they will say it won't make any difference anyway. And then they will state damningly, they're all the same anyway. So I'd love to hear your response to that. How do you intend to reach that hard to reach voter? Okay. Uh, here. Hi, Hi, good evening. Uh, thanks very much for allowing me to come along today. Uh, I'd just like to ask each candidate it's a two pronged question here. If you could tell me what the uh, act was replaced by the Equality Act in 2000. Uh, sorry. Uh, thanks for putting that. I'd just like to ask each candidate, it's a two-pronged question here, if they could tell me what act the Equality Act replaced, and also if they were to be voted into uh, become an MP, what are they going to do to protect local services, for, exam for example, Fife Institute for the Deaf, which has been shut, and they're now looking for, you know, scrambling about trying to get some place to go to. And there seems to be an asset strip going on with Fife Council where you know, services for people who have sensory impairments are being sold off and there seems to be you know, a lack of equality with regards to these, uh, uh, these uh, societies. And that's basically it, so good. Okay, thank you. And a gentleman here. Jeff. Hello, um, <coughs> Dave Davis. Many identities. Um, I really wanted to respond to the idea about not counting and uh, you know, talent rises to the top. Um, just three personal experiences. One, 
as a lecturer at Lord College in the 90s um, when women on the course were being told by their husbands that they shouldn't be there, that they were told they should be at the kitchen sink and they were being told that well they could do it as long as it didn't interfere with their tea being on the table. Now that doesn't give you a very equal platform to rise from. Um, <clears throat> in my own case, I was 53 before I had any employment protection, any employment rights, just because of who I am. Now that stopped me rising from the top because at any stage I could have been dismissed or denied a job. Not because of my work record, just because of who I am. And um, the, finest one, the final one is now for five years I've been disabled as well. You know, I fill seven out of the nine protected characteristics these days. And in terms of disability, I find that it's only the European courts and the European institutions that are sticking up for me. They're the only ones, as Roger said, about, you know, about this report about the systematic um, abuse of, of disabled people. So I really don't believe in this idea of, yes, we'll all come out at the end. You know, we're, we're all John Thompson's bears, it's not work for me. And really what I'd like to hear from each party um, was what their party's going to do to absolutely ensure that we will have all the protections uh, that come with the uh, European Convention on Human Rights and that there will be someone else uh, that will hold government's feet to the fire. I think that's my, my fear. If we were to get any government with a 20-year mandate, who's going to hold their feet to the fire? Thank you. It's just to ask the panel for the views on the leak clause and how you think this is going to affect families in the future. Start um, in reverse order this time, so we'll go um, with James. Thanks. Okay, uh, thank you for the, the questions. I'll uh, start off with the, uh, the question from the lady there uh, on the rape clause. Um, I mean, uh, once again, this is something which has made me ashamed. Uh, about the you know our government and what they've been doing, I think the you know this is you know quite frankly a travesty that uh, you know women are being asked this um, you know to prove you know as proof. Uh, personally, I would scrap the entire law. I think that's the and I think that uh, that's that's also what the Liberal Democrat uh, policy is on this. Uh, and a very minimum, we should be you know ending this clause and. Uh, um, this should not be something that women should have to go through. I mean, rape is a traumatic experience, and effectively they're being asked to rel relive it. Uh, that that isn't on, in my opinion. Um, and on the uh, yeah, if you could just make it very snappy so we can get through. Thank you. Okay, sorry. Uh, sorry. On the in terms of the uh, gentleman there on the uh, your. Sort of the European courts and the EU uh, institutions uh, protecting uh, you know various people. Uh, I wholeheartedly agree with you. Um, I think the you know we need to you know the European Court of Human Rights, for example, was set up to protect our human rights. It was there set up for every one of us. And there's been attacks from many in the Conservative Party over the years on the uh, the actions of the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, when the vast majority of what it does has been had a very positive in, impact in society, it was set up after World War Two, when we saw the you know the attacks on human rights then, and we have to continue you know with that in terms of the European Union, it enshrines a lot of uh, protections as well. That's why I'm pro-European. That's why you know Dave might talk about the bureaucracy in the EU. Well, actually, a lot of that bureaucracy is actually very positive, and it actually has. Uh, you know, it enshrines a lot of protections for our society. You know, the word bureaucracy should not just be a negative. There are positives about it as well. Uh, in for the uh, you know what would you know we do to protect lo uh, local public services. Uh, <coughs> so the Liberal Democrats, we do support uh, a policy. So my actual question was, can you tell me what Act the Equality Act replaced? I want to know if you can tell me what act. Just, you know, I just want to see what your political nonsense is and just to see what the... I've got to be honest. Uh, I mean, you asked two questions there. I'll tell, I'll tell you, it was a disability dis dis 
generation. Okay, I, I, I wasn't, I wasn't aware, I, mean, okay. I wasn't aware of that, and yeah. I'm, I'm going to be honest, I, I, I don't know everything. There's um, just a clip. Um, Are you going to speak me up? Um, no, but then I think um, quite happy to. Uh, I mean, I don't know whether that question you want to be actually answered or just a, a trick question for the. Not a trick question. I'm just wanting to. Because since, oh sorry. My main reason for asking that question is since the Equality Act came in to replace the Disability Discrimination Act, there seems to be a whole raft of regulation, etc., come in which has discriminated against those in society who need help the most. And my reason for raising the part about the you know, Fife Institute for the Deaf, it's not the only one. There are similar organisations throughout Fife who, because of Fife Councils, you know, sell it for a quick profit, are suffering. Now they seem to think that you know everything has to make a profit nowadays, but what is a public service? It's essential if people have sensory impairments or disabilities that these services are maintained and they're available for everybody. Uh, and what we're basically seeing is that misdirection of resources. You know, there's lots of money getting spent, but it's not getting spent in the right things. So that's that was basically the point I wanted to ask. You know, if you, you know, and I appreciate you maybe didn't know that. You know, we should look into that. And as I say, there's been like a watering down of the Disability Discrimination Act. And how can we have equality, you know, when we're treating people the way we do in society? You know, I think you really all need to get together and bang your heads together and get this sorted out because we're hearing the same old thing, the same old talking heads all the time. There's no action getting taken. You know, so that was, that's my main reason for raising that point. Thank you. Okay, thanks. I'll just let you. I mean, uh, you know, just to address uh, what you were saying about the, uh, um, in terms of the impact on local public services, uh, quite frankly with Fife Council, it's a case of it hasn't had the money. Um, and I, I mean, and the reason it's not had the money is because of Scottish Government policies over the last few years. That's not true. I mean, it's not true, uh, Okay, I think we, we uh, asked um, before the audience to be I know we're all very, very passionate about these issues. Yeah, sure. It is very, very, I mean, uh, we know there's a lot of things um, have happened due to a combination of things. And uh, it's, but then I'll, I'll leave it for the panel to answer. But I think it will be good if we remain respectful because I think for the panel, they actually received an email from me in advance to, to say that we want to be inclusive, we want to be respectful. And so far, they actually have behaved really well. So I would like the audience to equally behave I'm the sure same way. No, 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 I, I don't, I, 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 it's, I'm not, I don't mean it to be kind of disrespectful and I think we'll just give, give the panel a chance to answer and, and I think going back to the question about Equality Act, actually that replaced quite a number of legislation um, so Disability Discrimination Act is one of the many that has been replaced. Uh, but I think I'll, can can we just go back to the panel and let them answer? Thank you very much for your patience. Yeah, in terms of what's what's going on with Fife Council and cuts to services, quite frankly, a lot of this has come down to the fact that over the last decade under the SNP, we've seen a council tax freeze, but without the adequate uh, monies you know given back to the councils to make up for the shortfall in this. That's what's happened. Now, the Liberal Democrats, we proposed last year in the Scottish parliamentary elections for a 1p increase in income tax, um, and that would have actually made up for a lot of that shortfall uh, in the council's money, and would have meant that you know, public services would have, um, you know, would have been uh, you know, adequately funded. Of course, Labour and the Green, Labour and the, I'll be quick, yeah, yeah. Labour and the Greens, uh, they also had tax rising uh, you know, commitments uh, but interestingly, the two parties that did not uh, want to use significant use of our tax raising powers in Scotland were the Conservatives and the SNP. So make it, make that up. You know, whatever you, you what you think, that is the facts and the situation. And in order to gain revenue, we need to use taxation to do that. Um, in the last question, I think was uh, how to to reach the voters. Uh, I think, I mean the. There's obviously there is a lot of voter apathy. It probably doesn't help that we've had uh, God knows how many elections over the last uh, last three years. Uh, I think uh, you know the, there's a lot of there's there's a certain amount of voter fatigue there, and uh, it, 
I mean, it is, a, you know, I think a, the important thing is for people involved in politics to actually take the time to go and speak to, to people on the doorstep and actually go and understand people's concerns. It's, uh, you know, it's no use just talking through a microphone, but actually, you know, proper engagement, I think, is what's needed there. Okay, thank you, Dave. <coughs> right, just to try and rattle through a few of these. Um, we've heard much tonight about for the many, not the few. I'd ask you to consider that a political party that really only represented the few would never win an election. And one of the things we'll find out next week is whether the few actually outnumber the many. I, don't, I didn't know what the Equality Act replaced, but I know now, thank you. Um, the Fife Institute being, of the deaf being sold, at least two members of this panel will not be MPs in the future, but they will be councillors. They are the people you should be talking to first. The, the process that takes money from central government all the way through to spending in the council is so long and so obscure and so opaque that somebody at the start of it will not see what's at the end of it. Um, women um, should be at the kitchen sink. I'm just thinking of a whole host of women, not least Mrs Dempsey. If I said to them that to them, I wouldn't expect to get out alive. Um, he said, they're not all Jock Tamsin's bairns. I think actually that the bottom of this is the fact that we are all Jock Tamsin's bairns. He was a busy guy, Jock Tamsin. The, the solution, the ultimate solution to so much of this is to treat everybody as far as you possibly can as an individual, not to back package people up and categorise them with, with short labels and treat everybody categorised with a particular label as if they were the same. That's the root of an awful lot of the problems. That's a very easy thing for me to say and a very, very difficult thing to, to, to make happen and to sort out. But that's where we should be going. Um, the rape clause um, has been used, and I understand why it's been used, um, to conflate two different things, related but different. You can argue about the restriction of the relevant tax credits to particular number of children, and that's a debate you can have. have if, you, if you decide that that's what's going to happen, then a separate but linked question is, should you make allowances for those who find themselves with additional children? In a sense, and I'm very happy, very careful with my words here, I'm going to get them wrong and offend somebody. In a sense, out of their own control. I mean, one, one which hasn't created any sort of row is multiple births. Someone who goes from one child to four because they have triplets um, is entitled to a different arrangement from someone who goes from two to three under this system. And you then have to ask yourself, do you want to not provide a special dispensation for those who have been subjected to a pretty horrible experience, to a very horrible experience? Or do you want to provide that or not? And that's the question that you really need to ask. And that's a completely different question to the one that's been put. The um, human rights and, and the EU, um, I think you said something to the effect that the, the vast part of it is good and no one argues about it. But it doesn't follow that the precise set of arrangements that have come out of the EU are just exactly where we should be perfect and never to be altered. Around the edges of anything, there's room for improvement. There's a common denominator that features through all of the questions that's just been asked. And that is linked to how you want to be as a society and what kind of government you want to have who sets the policy agenda for that society. So the Disab Disabled Disability Discrimination Act was one of the acts that the Labour Party brought in. And if you look at some of the policies that we've been touched on today and, and we look at what we're trying to do. In my previous role, we used to say past performance was an indicator of future performance. If you look at the Conservative government's past performance and look at their record, then it's very clear that they don't have the interests of the many at heart. It's very clear that the interests of the many under this Conservative government have been systematically eroded over the last seven, eight, nine, ten years. And what we have a fundamental choice to make in this election is 
Who do you want to right that wrong? Who is going to be there at the end of the day who will have the interests of the many and not the few at heart? And there's a number of aspects to look at that. I can't even believe that we, we actually even have to talk about such a thing as a rape clause. Um, for anyone sitting here, it just makes you wonder why we have even got to that stage. But that is where we've got to. And I guess for me that comes back to the very fundamental, like how do you want to be treated as a person? And when we talk about treating people as individuals, then asking them about things to do with how they conceived their third child and was it through rape is not one of those questions I think we want to ask. I think in terms of how we hold people's feet to the fire, well, if you elect another Tory government and you give Theresa, mandate, Theresa May a mandate, we won't have people to hold feet to the fire because she will take that as a mandate to carry on the way that she has been carrying on. What you will be saying to Theresa May is that it's okay to treat people like this. It's okay that we sanction people for benefits. That it's okay that we undermine the rights of minorities in society and we just say the warm words but the actions really don't back that up. So my quest to you then is to hold feet to the fire, you need a Labour government. You need a Labour government who has a track record of addressing these fundamental social inequality and injustices in our society. You have a Labour government who has policies that are seeking to do that. And that is what I would urge you to consider. Because with all of these issues, you need a government that cares. And you need to replace the one that's currently there. Because clearly, based on its track record and its past performance, it doesn't. Thank you. Roger, finally. Uh, I'll start with the rape clause because I was speaking in the finance bill in the Commons, which is the bill that implements the budget, when I was tugged from behind by my colleague, SNP MP Alison Thewlis, who has subsequently led, I think, a tremendous campaign to raise awareness of the rape clause. And what she did was she handed me a thing called the Red, the red Book. This is got the detail of the budget, the things that the chancellors don't want to say when they make their speech. And she had highlighted the top of, I think it was page 77. And what I did is I, I couldn't believe what was written down there. So what I did was I simply read back to the government and to the Tory benches what was in their own proposals in the budget to introduce a clause that was meaning people were going to have to prove they had been raped before they would be entitled to a tax credit for a third child. The thing that was most appalling to me was not merely that that was in any proposed legislation. The thing that appalled me was the reaction of the Tory benches. And to be received by sniggers from the opposing benches, including from the front branch, I think questioned their overall morality on this at all. The other thing is, I said earlier this evening, I was trying to my wife Barbara, who talked about when she was sexually abused at six years old. Now, obviously, she was, it, it did not lead to pregnancy or anything like that. But somebody who's going through that, when she heard about that, you can imagine her utter horror and indignation. The thought that you were going to ask people to prove something is intrusive of that. It took her a lifetime before she could talk about something that was, some people would argue, not as severe as rape. How enough can you possibly think it's justified to put people through that? I think it is utterly and completely immoral. Uh, Kay asked the question to about uh, what about the people who don't bother? I mean, one of the problems we've had in the UK, the last general election was slightly different in Scotland, but for many years we've had declining participation in elections. And what I said in my victory speech the last time uh, uh, when I stepped forward was I said one of the things that was proudest to me about that election in Kirkcaldy and Cowden Beath was that we had the highest turnout at a general election for that seat in living memory. Uh, I worry whether we're going to maintain that level of uh, turnout in the future. I think what all politicians have to do is to engage with people who have in the past been likely not to participate in politics. I've been going around, yeah, not, 
just in campaign terms, but uh, uh, over the last two years. Just, can she just sum up? Thanks. Right. Different groups, religious groups and others, who have been marginalised. And I think what we all need to do is engage in, politicians need to take their responsibilities more to heart to engage with those who don't want to engage with us. Thank you very much um, for all the questions. Um, that brings us towards the end of the evening. We're not quite finished, um, Nina, before you rush in. Um, we um, do have evaluation forms that um, you should all have like some uh, thoughts on what you thought of the event tonight. We're also going to give the candidates um, a final two minutes um, each, um, should they wish to take it, to um, um, persuade you um, why you should get their vote next week. Um, Nina, did you want to add something? Yeah, um, I think, sorry, just a, a, a question from me and I hope that you can address it within your uh, summary. Um, how would you protect the interests of people of Fife? Because we, no, in Scotland, it's, it appears to be, no matter who we vote for, to be representing us in Westminster, it seems to make no impact on the Westminster policies. So how then you will protect the, pe the rights of the people of Fife? Because that is very important. We are a small voice and, a, I mean, in terms of population, it's a lot smaller compared to the rest of the UK. And so it's almost like we need a separate immigration policy just for Fife. We need to increase the population. The birth is rate is low and uh, we have a higher number of dependents who are maybe old, older or who have disabilities uh, and so so forth. I mean there's a lot of issues that we do need local solutions. So as a potential representative in Westminster, how will you protect our interests? Okay, so bearing in, that, in mind that final question, um, but, um, fortunately, we are running out of time, so it's going to have to be short. Um, so, <coughs> two minutes. Um, anyone? You can do far more if you're in power than if you're not. And I, s I say this from some experience as now being the longest continuously serving opposition councillor in Fife Council. Um, it's a frustrating process. Um, we're going to have either a Conservative or a Labour government. Because of, even given the changes in the polls recently, there's a reasonable likelihood we're going to have a Conservative government. Um, in order to best protect the interests of Fife, you need a, a member of that um, ruling party who has the interests of Fife at heart. And what better than someone who's born and brought up here and lived here most of his life? Thank you very much. Short and sweet. Um, yourself, James? Um, okay, well, uh, thanks for that question. Uh, I don't necessarily agree that uh, to have, uh, you know, to have, uh, you know, a conservative or Labour person in government uh, is uh, going to necessarily make sure that Fife's voice is uh, heard most. I think you, um, the fact is that when you have the party whip, sometimes you can uh, conveniently forget uh, what, uh, what what concerns most your local constituents. So I think you know really what you. What we need is MPs in Fife, because we have obviously a few constituencies in Fife, who will ensure that the, the local area comes first. Um, you know, this it's a, it's a case of that they will need to you know take into account the views of their constituents and of the local area. And at times, they they this doesn't necessarily mean they're completely always following the party line. And I think that's uh, that's one thing I would like to make a point of there. Uh, in regards to summing up everything else for tonight, uh, I think we've had a few very interesting points made and some really good questions. Uh, some of the some of the questions have obviously reflected uh, looking at uh, gender issues in regards to the diversity in politics. Something that you know there is a problem with in Westminster, and you know we you know we as a, the, the political uh, parties need to tackle that. Uh, there's Obviously, uh, issues regarding uh, the you know, refugee crisis that have been mentioned, more needs to be done and uh, it's just not been good enough and uh, the Liberal Democrats will you know, really be pushing for increased uh, numbers of refugees. 
workers' rights and the, the protections that we have in the European Union currently, they, they, the, the Conservatives have indicated, or at least some of them have, that they would, they would like to uh, discard uh, them, and that's something that I really want to, um, you know, want to stop. So, really, the Liberal Democrats will ensure that, uh, you know, we, we work with our European partners, that we still keep our links with Europe, that we keep our links with the UK, and we'll work to, you know, make a more inclusive and uh, equal society. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. When you were asking the question of what we can do to best represent the people in Fife or in uh, this constituency that I'm running in, in Cody and Cowden Beath, I think there are some fairly straightforward and simple things. One is you've got to be willing to listen to people and to be as inclusive as you can be. There are people in this room who are elected representatives for other parties who I've been perfectly happy to continually meet on a range of issues. And I think anybody has to take up the spirit of what this organisation itself is about and to say it's not about being sectarian here politically, it's about being willing to engage with everyone, including people who are your political opponents. I think it's important too that uh, whoever is going to elect it is going to get these famed expenses that MPs get. I've chosen to uh, devote those expenses to creating and hiring people within the constituency to serve the constituency rather than having two or three researchers at Westminster. That's my choice. I think that's a sensible choice for somebody who wants to serve their constituents. I think too there is the issue of being willing to be engaging with different groups. I don't think, people might correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think I've turned down an offer to go and talk to any charitable or other body in my time as an MP. And I would hope whoever is elected would take their same responsibilities uh, uh, to engage in that way. So I think once you're an MP to rep rep uh, represent a local area, you've got to make sure that although I have my own political preferences, the job of an MP is to represent everyone. Thank you very much. And finally, Leslie. This election is really about choice. It's about the choice about what kind of society we want to live in. And that is the big picture choice that we're making here. At a local level, I would put forward the fact that I already represent areas in this constituency. I already have a, represent a, repre uh, a rep a reputation, sorry. I already have a reputation. <laughs> <laughs> Depending on who you speak to. I have a reputation as someone who listens to communities, who works in partnership, has worked across a number of different political groups within the council, but also more broadly within the community. In addition to that, I think partnership is really the issue that we need to address here. If we want to be inclusive, we can't all do it by ourselves. We need to bring everyone to the table. And that is why we need to have a party that has built itself and its reputation and its track record on delivering for the many and not the few. And that is why, once again, I will say to you, you need to think about the society that you want to live in and the choices you have to make. Dave's absolutely right, there's going to be uh, two, two, two parties that will decide who will govern the UK. It will either be Labour, Labour or the Conservatives. And that is a very distinct choice for people to have to make. And that is really what this boils down to. I think it's also about understanding, not just about listening to people, but being prepared to get your sleeves rolled up, get stuck in and actually do something for your constituents. And as a local councillor, that is definitely where I have uh, established my reputation. And if I was elected here, then that is absolutely what I would be doing for this constituency. Thank you very much. Um, we'll just have a round of applause for our candidates. It's, it's not easy to come along and um, face the questions that you, you don't know what you're going to be asked, so thank you um, to everybody and equally a big thank you to yourselves for um, being in the audience and coming along um, to put your point of view across um, to the pr prospective candidates um, and ask some very interesting questions.
Um, I'd just like to remind you again about the um, evaluation forms. That's um, something that we want to get back if possible. Um, and just to say that this is the second hustings event that we've held um, in, in recent times. As we said, there's a lot of elections been going on. Um, but I think it's something that um, we I find a good response from, and maybe it's not just at election times that we should be able to be discussing these issues. So it, um, maybe it's something that we can look at in the future about um, holding um, similar events, um, but not necessarily around um, elections, just giving um, people in Fife a chance to speak to their elected representatives about the issues that are affecting them and about issues um, of equality. Um, I think Nina just wants to say something. Yeah, it's just uh, one last question for the audience. I mean, uh, uh, when you came in, you filled in the questionnaire for us. That was very helpful. I just want to, uh, you know, just put your hands up if somehow you, the choice who you're going to vote for, which party you're going to vote for, has been changed as a result of um, the, the, the performances of our panel members today. Show of hands, anybody as we have been swayed to, to change the vote? No? Okay. That's, that's very helpful. Please, very easy to count for us. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for everybody. And it has been a fantastic evening and, and I'm, you know, well done Leah again for sharing another wonderful event. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, there's still tea and coffee if anyone punches it and some food at the end.